I've been in the housing business over 45 years, and, and what I'm inclined to say is that I've never seen a housing crisis in this country as bad as that that exists today. It's hard for the two-thirds of Americans who can afford their rents and their mortgages to really recognize the dilemma that one-third of our citizens have. So we have in this country about 125 million households, 63.7%, um, according to the latest stats, are homeowners, and the balance are renters. But the renters, as you might guess, make about half of what the homeowners make. Um, and as the company has, as the country has recovered from the Great Recession, it's been very uneven. You all know the stats. Uh, lower income people just have not advanced at all. In the meantime, um, housing that's being built these days is more and more expensive. I tell people in the southeast where Peter Pappas and I are building some suburban garden apartments that the cheapest apartment we can build is $160,000 per unit and that half the country can't afford that. Uh, Doug Bibby from National Multi Housing Council says we're losing 125,000 affordable rental units every year. And we have only one production program of any consequence, that's the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. That builds about 50,000 new units, targeted at people making 60% of area median income. So we're going backwards. Um, we, we've talked with Speaker Ryan about his anti-poverty program. I, I think uh, it's fair to say that the United States has the worst poverty housing situation in the first world. And we have a national policy, but it's an old policy that's in my opinion, way out of date. Um, we, we had, uh, with my foundation in New Hampshire, we had a housing forum. We had seven presidential candidates. One of the things that uh, Pam Patnode and I and our advisory board have been trying to do, Scott Brown has been great in terms of having backyard barbecues for all the presidential candidates coming through on the Republican side, is to make them aware of what is going on in this country and to try and get the presidential candidates uh, to talk about housing. Um, it's, it's really very hard to get done. Uh, so we have a situation where one out of six American families spend more than half their income on housing. 50% of renters spend more than 30% of their income on housing. That leaves them very little for the other necessities of life. We are advocates of a lot more affordable housing being built. Uh, whether it's ownership or rental, but the tsunami of demand is in rental. It's an interesting stat. Um, Carol Galante, the former FHA commissioner, who's now out of Cal Berkeley, said to us recently, there are no more homeowners in this country today than there were 10 years ago. As you all probably know, about 7 million families were foreclosed on, have not returned to the ownership ranks, so now one third of our rental housing is single family. Families want to rent single family homes. That's really hard to come by. We have no production program for that. That's just older housing that uh, investors are owning and will rent to families who want a home, not an apartment. So we have a situation that's deteriorating. Exacerbating the problem is that somewhere around 80%, four out of five new households are minority, led by Latinos and secondly African Americans, and Latino and African American incomes tend to be significantly lower than non-Hispanic white incomes or Asian American incomes. So the idea that they'll become homeowners while an aspirational goal for virtually all of them is in fact gonna be challenging. Their home ownership rates are currently in the mid to low 40s. Um, I was talking with Dave Stevens of the mortgage bankers the other day about where home ownership rates are going to go. They've fallen from 69.2 to 63.7. According to the Urban Institute, they're going to continue to fall towards 60%. And every 1% fall is 1.2 million households. So while the percentages moving don't seem that big, there are a lot of people involved in that. One production program, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, otherwise, um, we're left to try and preserve. And you'll hear from Daryl 
and our panel today about some of the efforts that are being undertaken to preserve existing rental housing. But it's really tough, and, and we've been involved in something called How Housing Matters at Enterprise, and Enterprise uh, Community Partners, incidentally, which I think is maybe the largest nonprofit affordable housing advocate. I'm a chairman of that. We have a, a project, uh, we, we have a campaign called Make Room to acknowledge that more than 11 million renters spend over half their income on housing. So we're all trying to figure out what policy solutions to advocate for. The 1949 Housing Act uh, set an aspirational goal for the United States that every American family have an affordable home in a suitable location. The, the location is important too, because if we're gonna talk about helping people come out of poverty, their children have to be able to get to a decent school. Raj Chetty has recently done some research, a researcher from Harvard, on the importance of families growing up in middle-income neighborhoods and how the outcomes for those children, whether it's educational outcomes or job outcomes, are different. So since Speaker Ryan has a real anti-poverty program, what we're trying to do is convince him and others that, that having a simple, decent, affordable home is foundational. There's not any way kids are going to have good educational outcomes. People are going to be able to get to, to work, to decent uh, grocery stores, to health care, if they don't have an affordable home. And it's consuming so much of the income. There's a new book out called Evicted. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. Those of us in the housing space have heard of it now, which is tracking what's happening to families in rental housing when they're paying 70 and 80% of their income for housing and they miss a payment and it's so unstable. So if our country is getting more and more diverse and 80% of household growth is minority, I would argue we need to do something to change that trajectory. We need to, we should, I think, follow the 1949 Housing Act's aspirational goal to make housing a priority. Um, we couldn't successfully get politicians to talk about it. I am delighted to say that uh, Secretary Clinton and uh, now Bernie Sanders both now at least have some housing platform for us to talk about. We're really trying hard now to, when, when we get a platform for the, the candidates that ultimately surface, look like they're surfacing now, to get them to put housing on their platform because it's just not a very comfortable thing for politicians to deal with. I've been to Congress talking to the senators and congressmen for the last two years. They're really not aware of this crisis. We call it the silent housing crisis. They're not very much aware of it. And we, we argue that housing matters, that there is a crisis, and that it's hurting the economy of the United States. These young people coming up who are unable to get a decent education, who are in poverty, are not going to become productive citizens. They're going to become welfare recipients. And there's something we should do about it. So today in the United States, it was interesting to me when we had our housing forum in uh, New Hampshire, two of the seven presidential candidates thought that the federal government had no role in housing. And I don't know what you all think about it. I mean, it's it's a responsibility, I think, at every level of government, clearly, and we're going to talk some about that today, what can be done locally and at the state level. But today in the United States, we spend $200 billion a year on housing subsidy. And as I said earlier, you need subsidy to build something affordable, because construction costs and land costs are so high that the market rate people can't provide affordable rental housing. So we need a subsidy. It can come in the way of subsidizing new construction, which is what the Low Income Housing Tax Credit does, or it can come in subsidies by giving vouchers to individuals or finding some other way to help supplement their income. Today, of the $200 billion we spend, three quarters of it goes to home ownership. Even though homeowners make twice as much as renters, three quarters of the subsidy and it comes through the tax code, mortgage interest deductions being the biggest part of it, state and local property tax deductions, capital gains exclusions. But you have to itemize to take the mortgage interest deduction. Only 30% of American families itemize. So most of the people who need it aren't really getting the help. And on the rental side, 
where there is desperate and growing need, only one out of four people who are eligible for support get it because there's only $50 billion available. I say only. Sounds like a lot of money, but it's not at all nearly covering what the demand is. So what we are in my foundation advocating is that we recalibrate uh, where we spend our money in this country, that we find different ways to incent home ownership. Right now, we're having a whole lot of, tr of trouble getting people into home ownership because rents have risen so much that people can't save for a down payment. Restrictions are tougher on who can qualify. And I think what we should, as a nation, aspire to is having every family who wants to be a sustainable homeowner have that opportunity. But they need a hand in the mortgage interest deduction and state and local property tax deductions, I would argue, are not giving them the help that they need. So we're in a dilemma, and um, we're trying to elevate this issue, trying to tell people there's a silent housing crisis in this country. And we all have a vested interest in doing something about it.